on our second week of looking at this letter from three unique perspectives because there's really three unique persons that are involved in this letter that Paul wrote in the first century. There's Paul who penned the letter, the great apostle. There is Philemon who was the recipient of the letter, who was apparently very involved in the early church. It met at his house in this particular place and he appears to have been a friend of Paul's. So there paths had crossed at some point. And then there's Onesimus, who was Philemon's slave, who apparently had run away, and yet his path at some point had crossed with Paul's. And so now Paul is bringing these three together in the things that he's asking Philemon to do and the things that he's asking Onesimus to do. And from each perspective, I think, there is so much that is instructive for us. For starters, the fact that the Holy Spirit would preserve a letter between these three individuals is instructive to us because it reminds us that our personal relationships with one another have so much to do with God's calling on our lives together. We're not just called to gather on a Sunday once a week or once in a while and sing a few songs and hear a great message. God actually wants our lives to be intertwined and united in a way that it really becomes a part, a powerful illustration of the message that we preach. This good news of reconciliation, that we have been reconciled to God and that that power is being put on display in the way that we are being reconciled also with and to one another and all that God is bringing into his family. And so there's there's so much here for us in this letter. Last week, we looked at it from Philemon's perspective. This week, I want to look at it uh, through the perspective of Onesimus, who, again, was the runaway slave. And I wanna state my goal up front, just so you can get a sense of where I'm going. I want to talk to you this morning about repentance. And I guess maybe just for starters, what do you think of when you hear the word repentance? What kind of images or tone does that bring up to you? Is is repentance an inviting word? Is it something that you think is a good thing that you go, oh, cool, we're going to talk about repentance this morning? (laughs) I I would guess that for most of us, if you bring up the subject of repentance, what you see is something like a bony finger in your face, you know, with someone kind of spitting while they yell, repent. It's not, not a very inviting idea. I think that's the the impression that a lot of us have of repentance. And so my goal up front that I wanna state to you is my my goal is to rescue repentance from the misunderstanding that I think so many of us might have about this word. It's, It's not something you hear a lot of people talk about anymore, even in the church. And yet, repentance is something that is central to the good news. That's what I want you to consider just at the very start. Repentance is a central part of the gospel, which is good news. So unless our understanding is off or misguided, when we hear repentance, what we should think is, oh, this this has to do with good news. This is good news. This this has to do with the gospel. And what what I want to do through looking at this idea in the lens of scripture this morning, specifically with Philemon and Onesimus in this relationship, I wanna rescue repentance from a vague sense of feeling bad to a clear sense of it being one of the greatest gifts that God gives by his grace. That's what repentance is, it's a gift. And it's from God's grace. So that's the goal, okay? Straight out from the beginning, up front, directly, 
I want us to have a better understanding of repentance and not just think when we hear about repentance, oh yeah, repentance, okay, I'm, sp- I'm supposed to feel bad about myself. I'm supposed to feel bad about stuff. No, that's bad news. This is good news. This is repentance. And the idea, I think, maybe just to begin uh, with this theme is, is to think of it this way. In a world that's constantly changing, is that a fair description of the world we live in? A world, in fact, that's changing so rapidly, it's nearly impossible to keep up with. New technologies and and new ways of doing things and new words and old words that mean new things. And it's really hard to keep up with the, the pace at which the world we live in is changing. And so think of it this way. In a world that's constantly changing, it's, it's been said the only constant in this world is that things will change. Isn't it a gift to be brought into relationship with a God who doesn't change? For you Bible students, theology people, uh, seminarians, whoever you are, it's really not on that level. But this is, this is with reference to what we call God's immutability. Right? That's the fancy term for this belief that God doesn't change. He's constant. He's consistent. And and don't think of it in terms of God's frozen, like he just, he only ever says one word to every question. He doesn't change. No. God changes in the sense that depending on the situation or the person or the surroundings, God will have a different reaction and response to different things, but all of his responses and reactions will be perfectly consistent with his perfect character. He's unchanging. And and the reason it's such a good thing that God is unchanging is that God is, all of his characteristics are perfect. All of God's character is perfection. So this is a good thing that God doesn't change. But, but think about this. In a world where so much needs to change, is that a fair characterization? You look at the world we live in and go, there's a lot that needs to change. Isn't it also a gift that we have the ability to change? Do you agree with that? So I know it's kind of a lot of back and forth, but God who doesn't change unchangingly offers us the gift to change in a world that needs to change, right? Repentance. Now, how does this come to play or into view with the letter that we've just read with these characters, Philemon and Paul and Onesimus? Well, I want you to imagine, we're using our sanctified imaginations again this morning. It's not a bad thing. God's given you that imagination. And so imagine that you're Onesimus. Imagine that you were a slave and somehow you managed to escape that place in your life, which was not always something that slaves, it was actually rare that a slave could be successful in escaping that position or place in life. And so you escape, you manage to do it. You're on your own, you're out there. And at some point, your path crosses with this great apostle Paul. And through a series of events, he he begins to tell you about this Jesus who died and who, who rose again. And you come to put your faith in Christ. And you have this close and meaningful relationship with Paul, who at this point is in prison, and you're serving him and walking alongside of him, and you have this great privilege of participating with him in some way in this great work that he's doing of spreading the good news about Jesus. And and then you have to imagine someday, we don't know how it happened, it's not in the letter, but it must have happened in some way and at some point Paul brings it up to Onesimus. Hey, I've been thinking about something. And I want you to think about it too. What's that, Paul? Well, I've heard about 
the faith of the church in Colossae, and I've just finished writing a letter to that church to encourage them and, and strengthen them. And as I was writing that letter, I realized that there's a guy that I know there in Colossae, and the church is meeting in his house, I've heard, and he's an old friend of mine. His name is Philemon. And somehow in the exchange, it comes to Paul's attention that Onesimus knows Philemon. And he knows him because he used to be one of his slaves. And again, I don't know how it happened or when or where, but somewhere in the course of the conversation or conversations, Paul suggests, you know, Onesimus, I think you need to go back and make things right with Philemon. In fact, I'm sending him a letter along with the one that I wrote to the church at Colossae, and I'm sending you with Epaphras with these two letters, and I want you to go. I mean, can you even wrap your mind around, like, are you serious, Paul? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you want me to do what? And I just wonder, I wonder things, again, they're not, they're not in the scripture, but there's good reason to wonder this. Like, like, did Paul ever discuss with Onesimus what he wrote in Colossians 3 and 4? Or was Onesimus there when he heard Paul dictating it as it was being written down? What do I mean? Listen to this. The end of Colossians 3 as Paul gives these instructions to Christian households for everyday life, wives and husbands and children and parents. And then he comes to this place in verse 22 of Colossians 3 where he says, Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Do not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. And then four, verse one, masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Did Onesimus hear those words? Did Paul discuss them with him? Did this ever come up in conversation? And what would he think? Again, if we're using our imagination, maybe Onesimus heard Paul dictating those words, and maybe it was him who felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit as a believer, and he came back to Paul and said, Paul, you know, I heard what you wrote to the Colossians, and I wanted to let you know that I know Philemon I used to be one of his slaves. What, what should I do? What would the Lord have me do? So we don't know how it came about. We don't know how the information came out. What we know is that Paul sends Onesimus back with this letter, and the letter is written to Philemon, and the instructions are for Philemon to receive Onesimus, his former slave, back. But check this out. Verse 16 of Philemon that we read this morning, no longer as what? A slave. What? This was an offense at that time that was punishable, severely punishable. And so Paul's asking something huge of Onesimus, and he's asking something huge of Philemon, it's a whole change in the way that they're thinking and that people in those days would have thought about it all. And we have good reason to believe. Here, here's something really cool to think about. We have really good reason to believe that this went really well. Why do we have reason to believe that this letter and what Paul was asking, even though it was massive, 
and so far from what anyone would have expected or done in those days naturally. We have good reason to believe that it was received and that it went well. Why? Well, for starters, we have the letter, <laughs> which means that Philemon, when he received it, didn't just get ticked and burn it and throw it in the garbage. He kept it and treasured it. And another reason it's by inference to believe that this went well is that I don't know that this would have been preserved as something really wonderful by the church if Philemon wouldn't have carried out the instructions. I mean, imagine if Onesimus comes back, I, Philemon gets the letter and he's like, I'm not doing that. And he, and he has Onesimus beaten or worse, which could have happened in those days had him killed. I don't think the church would have preserved this letter as this wonderful reminder of some horrible event. So there's good reason. In fact, there's an interesting detail in history, not in scripture, but check this out. Somewhere between 110 and 115 AD, one of the early church fathers named Ignatius wrote a letter to the bishop of Ephesus whose name was, guess, Onesimus. Now, we can't be certain. It could have been anybody. But here's the crazy thing. It's not impossible. It's not impossible for this letter to be a part of the story of a young runaway slave who is called to go back to his former master, who together they were called to change the way that they thought about everything. And this slave actually become, became a very respected and significant leader in the church 55 years later. Wouldn't that be an incredible end to this story? I think so. But really what Paul is calling for, the, the biblical term, even though the word doesn't appear in the letter itself, the idea is repentance. And so I want to look with you this morning at what repentance is, what repentance does, and where repentance comes from. And I want to use this story in considering it sort of as the backdrop of these ideas. Let's start with what repentance is. Remember, we're wanting to rescue repentance from a vague sense of feeling bad about ourselves. So the next time someone brings up repentance, we're not just like, oh yeah, okay, it's time to feel bad. No, this is good news. Repentance is to change one's way of life as the result of a complete change of thought and attitude. To put it in a, in a picture, think of the story, the well-known story that Jesus told of the prodigal son, right? A story that we all love. My youngest daughter, Galilee, we were praying, playing Bible baseball a couple months ago, and she refers to it as the portable son. So prodigal son, portable son, you can put them in your pocket, take it along. But the story goes that the son came to his father, demanded his inheritance early, the father gave him his inheritance. He went and he wasted it, living a, a crazy sort of party lifestyle in rebellion to his father. And there's that part of the story where he'd run out of money. He'd run out of everything. The only job that he could find was feeding the pigs. And he was so hungry and so poor and so alone that he's actually seen in the story eating the food from the pigs. He's in a low, low place. And it says in the story that Jesus tells that he came to his senses. That's repentance. It's the moment where the prodigal son goes, what am I thinking? And do you remember what he says? The servants in my father's house have it better than me. This is awful. <laughs> Why am I living like this? Why am I starving? Why am I alone? Why am I covered in filth feeding the pigs? I don't have to live like this. He comes to his senses. He changes his thinking and he says to himself, I will go and he's rehearsing this speech. I'm gonna go tell my father I'm not worthy to be your son anymore, but I just wanna be a servant in your house. 
We love this story, right? He, he goes home and the father is seen each day looking out for his son. Day after day, week after week, month after month, we don't know, but the day finally comes when the son is seen turning up the driveway, so to speak, and the father goes running to him. And I love the story because the son starts, you know, performing his rehearsed speech. Father, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore. And the father just interrupts it. And he says, bring a robe, bring a ring, put sandals on his feet, kill the fattest calf. We're having a feast. We're celebrating my son is home. Jesus told this story to show us what God's heart is like. Don't you love God's heart? See, we get repentance wrong because we get God's heart wrong. God is the father who's looking for his sons and daughters to come home. And repentance is that moment when we finally come to our senses and say, why am I living like this? To be a servant in my father's house is better than, than all of this. Repentance is to rethink your thinking, to change your mind in the way you view the world. If God's good kingdom is coming, then rethink everything. Everything. That's where we're living right now as followers of Jesus. We're living in the place of faith and hope that the day is coming where the Lord will return to restore and to rule that his kingdom will be established on this earth and everything will be made right that is wrong. That's what we believe. And so if we believe that he's coming, that he's already come and that this kingdom is already here and it's breaking out among the people of God that are living in this world, but we're living as exiles. We're, we're living as those who are waiting for him to come. And so we're waiting. But in our waiting, we look at the world around us and we realize we have to rethink everything because it's not the way it's supposed to be. It's, it's not the way it is in God's kingdom, and so he taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's the kingdom we're waiting for, praying for. That's the kingdom that's coming. That's the kingdom we are participating in presently as we rethink everything around us. But here's maybe a way that we can sharpen it and it's necessary. As Christians, we're not just rethinking everything just for the sake of rethinking it. In other words, we're rescued from the ridiculousness of just going from one bad idea to another. Do you guys ever look out in the world that we're living in right now and you see everybody reacting to the last bad idea but the new idea is just as bad if not worse as the last one was? Anybody relate to that? It just seems like, man, there's a lot of bad ideas that are being put forward as good ideas just because they're different than the last ideas. But when you really look at it, you go, I don't, I don't think this is going to work out really well. So what rescues us from that? Repentance. And here's, here's how I want you to think about it this morning. Not just rethinking everything randomly. Not just reacting from one extreme to the other, driving from one ditch into the next. But think of it this way, rethinking God's thoughts. When you were little, did you ever wish you could draw really well and you couldn't? And so you would put a picture and put a piece of paper over that picture and you would trace it. Some of you probably even claimed you drew it. <laughs> That's the sense, I think, as God's 
children, that we live in this world. We're rethinking everything, but not just on our own. We're saying, God, what are your thoughts? What have you revealed to us? And how can we trace those lines? We want to rethink your thoughts. And there's an incredible way that this happens in the book of Philemon. Because as I said last week, it's the only one of Paul's letters where the cross and the resurrection are not mentioned specifically and explicitly, which is quite a big deal if you know Paul and you read his other letters. Like when he says in Corinthians, I purposed from now on to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. He doesn't even mention that in Philemon. Why? Well, think of it this way. I can't get past this thought that Colossians and Philemon arrived together in a bundle. And it's kind of like us every Sunday morning. We hear a sermon, but we're only halfway at that point because then we have to ask, God, what are you speaking to me? How does this apply to my life? And the most amazing thing is that the sermon to the church at Colossians came with a follow-up letter, the specific application to a man named Philemon. Here's how this message applies to you, Philemon. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to rethink everything. But to go a step further, not, not just on your own, Look at how Paul does it. Paul Paul does this in the most amazing way. He says to Philemon two things. Follow this. Verse 18, if Onesimus has wronged you, charge it to me. In other words, if, if Onesimus owes you anything or has done anything wrong to you, charge it to me. Treat me as if I was Onesimus owing you the debt. And verse 17, when Onesimus comes, treat him as if he were me. What's Paul doing? Repentance. He's tracing the lines of what Jesus has done for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the what? Righteousness of God in Christ. What does that mean? God treated his son as if he was us covered in the guilt and shame of our sin. He bore that punishment and judgment for us on the cross so that as we come to God, what does God do? He treats us as if we were his son. Rethink everything. And that rethinking traces the lines of the revelation of Jesus himself. And it changes the relationships of these three men. Do you see what a gift repentance is? It's not a vague feeling of like, oh, I feel bad about myself and some of the things in the past. No, I'm, I'm rethinking everything in light of who Jesus is and what he's done for me. It changes everything. It's so powerful. Well, that's what repentance is. What does repentance do? Could probably go on, but we don't have time, so I'll just say two things quickly, and the first is that repentance frees us. It's a good thing. It's good news. Have you ever been trapped in bad thinking? I was this week. I'm so thankful for repentance that I can change my thinking Listen to what Paul says in 2 Timothy 
chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone able to teach patiently, enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And then watch this. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses, there it is again, and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. What is repentance? It's coming to our senses. What does it do? It frees us from the snare that we are in by revealing to us the truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. Dear brothers and sisters, repentance is a wonderful, beautiful thing. To no longer be deceived, to no longer be fooled, to no longer be caught in our muddled, unclear, selfish, foolish thinking, but to be freed by the truth, to be rescued. Repentance frees us, Paul says, and repentance refreshes us. Do you remember on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up to preach? He preached about Jesus' death and resurrection and the people were convicted in hearing about what Jesus had done for them and they said to Peter, what should we do? And listen to what Peter says. Acts 3, verses 19 through 21. Repent, therefore, and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Church, I would love for us to believe what the scriptures say, to be set free by the truth of this, that to change our thinking and retrace the lines of God's thoughts that have been revealed to us through his word, illuminated for us by his spirit, is to be refreshed. Times of refreshing come from his presence when we rethink the way that we're living and the attitudes that we're holding. Let me just say a word and we'll close on where repentance comes from. Where does repentance come from is a good question to ask. In the Bible, in the verse that we've already read in 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 and 26, says that it is a gift from God. God, who does not change, holds out to us the ability and the gift of repentance, that we could change our thinking and change our ways. This is a gift from God. It's a gift from God's kindness. Romans chapter two, verse four. Do you remember what Paul wrote? Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? There's an interesting story in Luke 13 where there were a couple of tragedies that had happened in Jerusalem, and so the people had come to Jesus asking, like so many of us do in times of tragedy, why did this happen to these people? Why, why do tragic things happen in our lives? And, and Jesus says something that kind of seems a little bit insensitive. You ever notice Jesus does that sometimes? Sometimes, yeah. He, he says, hey, Unless you repent, you will also perish. It's like, whoa. What's he saying? You need to rethink how you look at tragedy because you're asking the question, why did this happen to these people? 
And the question behind the question is, right, why do good, bad things happen to good people? But the question from God's perspective is, why are any of us here at all? Living in rebellion against him? Separated from God in sin? When Jesus says to people in the face of tragedy, repent lest you also perish, what he's pointing to is it's the kindness of God that we have not perished. When we see tragic things happen, it should grab our attention. It brings things into perspective. If you watch people that go through tragedy, there's a clarity in those times where it's like, wow, what's important suddenly becomes crystal clear. The priorities fall into place. Now there's clarity, and now I can see, God, it's your kindness that you are so patient with me that you let me go on and that you don't just wipe me out. Oh, God, may this cause me to turn to you in your mercy. That's what Paul says in Romans. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And lastly, it's God's patience. Very similar to that lesson in Luke 13. Listen to what Peter writes in 2 Peter verse 9 of chapter 3. He says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Just before that, Peter's talking about the judgment that's coming to the world. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it like this, but, but guys, we're longing for God's judgment. It's true. That's why we're so hyped up politically right now, because we're longing for someone to come and make things right. We're longing for someone to enact some policy or law or procedure or something that will put right everything that's wrong in the world. Who will do this for us? Peter says, in that is a longing for the judgment of God because God is the judge of all the earth who will one day come and put everything right. We're longing for this. We can tweet about it, our opinions, but no one can actually accomplish it. Nobody can do it. And all of our hopes in politicians and all of these other things is just leaving us more and more and more disappointed because we're longing for the judgment of God. But here's Peter's point. When you listen and look for the judgment of God's coming, and when there comes along those that scoff and say, you guys have been talking about that for thousands of years. Come on, you really still believe that? Peter says in the verse before, no, 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 don't misunderstand this. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So don't look at God's slowness and think that he's slacking off. Understand that he is patient he is patient because he wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants no one to perish. He's patient because when he comes and when he comes to make everything right, that's it. So though there is something in us longing for God to come and put things right, there is something at the same time in us that feels the tension, but there are so many that I know who aren't right with God, and if he comes today, that's not going to be a good thing. They will fall under his judgment. So God, be patient. Thank you for your patience, Lord. Thank you for your kindness that has given us all this time to repent. God is not slack, church. He's kind and he's patient, willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance.
Would you pray with me?